race boots look more like sneakers from a distance. So I'm sure one or two IMSA officials have got rather confused with them being in their civvies when actually they're in a full race suit. Car 10 being driven again very quickly indeed by Kanwe Kobayashi uh, back onto pit lane and Joe Bradley's watching this stop for us. Yeah, I think Kamui's going to stay in the car though, Johnny. It's, uh, it's on the pit area now. That I'm not sure it even took tyres on there. I think we've just seen a refuel stop there. I'll head down there. I'm kind of watching it as I get closer to it. And as far as I can see, it was only fuel. The tyres were brought out onto the apron, but the last minute decision to not change onto brand new Michelin rubber. The brand new Michelin rubber remains on the pit wall. And uh, we'll, uh, yeah, that's confirmed. So just fuel for the number 10. Yeah, OK. It was a 33-second stop, by the way. I can tell that by the sort of purpley-coloured, uh, normally positional lights on the side of the car, but uh, during a pit stop, they count up and tell me 33 seconds. Back into the lead, that uh, positional light now turns to a white number one, and the number 10 car continues into the night. You're tuned to RS2, IMSA Radio across the USA and around the world. Uh, live from trackside at Daytona International Speedway, it's uh, Johnny Palmer and Joe Bradley with the 24 hours of Daytona. The next hour of racing starts now. Konica Minolta, Cadillac DPI with Kanwe Kobayashi, the very rapid Japanese driver heading up onto Speedway Turn 1 here at Daytona. You can often just lose that car because of its uh, jet black livery and on the back straight, the only thing piercing through the night are when it slows the very, very red brake rotors or brake discs on the front and rear and that uh, little blue pilot light, if you like, on the top of the car. Uh, but when it's at a certain angle, even lose the headlights as well. Rooftop Ray again back here at Daytona. Thanks, as always, for all his help, his help uh, giving us footage on the live stream from that lone camera at the top of the grandstand. This is Daytona number 25 for Rooftop Ray, and that's without a break as well. So a happy quarter century to you, Ray. As he tracks the number 10 car. We're in sound and vision, by the way. So if, uh, if you're out and about and uh, about to head home or perhaps out of the car and you can do it safely, then do latch on to our live stream, radiolamont.com. It can be found there. And uh, it's sound and vision perfectly synced to enjoy yet another hour of the Daytona 24. We're into hour 15 now. Here's the order in DPI. Kamui Kobayashi, car number 10, the Konica Minolta Cad Cadillac DPI. That makes it uh, the first of three caddies, in fact, out front, because 28.1 seconds further back, Sebastian Bourdais in the JDC Miller prepared Mustang sampling racing Cadillac is in second position. That's the car number five. And then his old teammate, we can say, the 31 car, which is still an Action Express machine, the Whelan Engineering Racing caddy of Mike Conway is in third position. And the gaps come down now between Bourdais and Conway because of Bourdais' recent pit stop. Just five seconds between the five and the 31. Fourth position is Oliver Jarvis in the first of the Mazda Team Yurst DPIs, car 77. And... It's the difference between Conway and Jarvis, around about 40 seconds. It's then 30 seconds back to the sister uh, Mazda of about half a second, and a further 40 seconds then back to the uh, sixth place car of Juan Pablo Montoya, and that's the uh, first of the Acura DPIs. Let's get a word with Rahel Fry, who was a relatively late sign up at the gear by GRT Grassa Lamborghini Huracan, now with Joe. Rahel, the, uh, the problem that stopped the car earlier, clearly uh, now sorted, car going well. Yeah, we hope so. We are not sure for 100%, but uh, the mechanics, they did a great job. Yeah, unfortunately, we lost uh, several laps, more than 30, and uh, we all know to catch them back, it's, it's so, so difficult. But right now, the car is running smoothly again, and uh, yeah, hope it stays like this, so um, we keep the fingers crossed. 
pressure pressure is now off. All you can do now is just enjoy the drive and uh, just see where you come. Unfortunately, it is, yes. That's what it is. Um, what exactly was the problem? Did the team tell you? Uh, something within the tank. Um, we've um, suddenly lost uh, fuel pressure. And we all know um, an engine can't run without fuel. So uh, unfortunately, we had to stop then. Uh, but it's, yeah, as you said, it seemed to be fixed. Um, keep the finger crossed that it stays like this. Great stuff, great drive. Sorry, guys, I'm tripping over people here. Johnny, let me get out of here. <laughs> Rahel Fry, uh, always very knowledgeable, I find, you know, not only is she super fast, but also uh, when, when willing to, she will tell you what's wrong with the car as well. Sadly, a, a horrible end to the European Le Mans series season at Portimao uh, when uh, her crew at Kessel Racing driving a uh, GTE Ferrari were in contention to finish second in the championship, but uh, an incident well, actually, in the opening lap, where several cars were involved, a horrible moment, actually, where an LMP2 car was sideways. Um, one of the, the Thunderhead Carlin uh, Delaras and uh, many GT cars further back with nowhere to go. And sadly, her car was one of them, not being driven by Rahel at the time. But uh, there was then a red flag period, and they really hoped they could get the car fixed and back out, but it wasn't to be. I'm sure they'll come back fighting again, though in that championship and indeed in this particular race where it's a GT3 car at the uh, all-female driver lineups disposal heading down off the banking and into turn number one is the 48 car with the green detailing that's the Paul Miller racing Lamborghini Huracan now scored as the leader in GT Daytona second position and it's sort of flip-flopping between the two Huracans at the moment is the 44, which came in for its latest pit stop from the lead. And Marco Mapelli handed over to John Potter. So Potter second, and really not very far away from uh, Corey Lewis. The margin is 1.6 seconds, and it's even less than that now as they head out of the Western Horseshoe and towards turn six. Probably measure it in car lengths, actually, as they slowed for the left-hander. It, uh, it's probably about 10 or 12 car lengths between the two. The 48 Paul Miller car catching up with one of the Acuras, and that's not the blue 57 car, so there therefore must be the other NSX in GTD, which is the number 86 car of Mario Farnbacher, currently 14th position. So if 48 can get ahead of the 86, that would put that car another lap down. But it's uh, sadly a number of laps down already because of early dramas for the Meyershank Racing with Kerb Agajanian. And that 86 car 14th ahead of Catherine Legg. But again, there are many laps between those two cars. What's that? 23 laps between Farnbacker and Catherine Legg and the gear racing car, which is Rahel Fry's mount. Just been hearing from her. Uh, I was giving you an order in DPI. Pretty much got down to sixth position and Juan Pablo Montoya. Matthias laced uh, in the 85 JDC Miller car, the all yellow Cadillac, completes the top seven in DPI. And the recovery drive for Acura number seven continues with Acura number, yes, seven, eighth place in class, and that is Alexander Rossi charging his way through after, if you weren't around in the early stages of the race, a nasty-looking clash between Elio Castaneves and, and uh, Harry Tinknell into the bus stop. Tinknell assessed as the driver at fault. He was given a drive-through penalty, but it took about 40 minutes. I think I had it down as actually 38 minutes and 38 seconds for the number seven car to be repaired and head back into the race. So we're at a stage now where Rossi's only got three LMP2 cars ahead of him and he'll be back with the main bank of DPIs, at least on the timing screen. But he is 22 laps down on the overall leader. GTLM uh, leader is Chazzy Mostert. Um, the other thing that we noticed earlier on in the week from the Chevrolet Corvettes, the C8Rs, 
uh, we'll particularly see this at night as well, is not only the glowing exhausts that are red hot, but there's this Bunsen burner effect out of each of the exhausts, which is a, I don't know, three or four inches of a sort of blue flame which protrudes from the exhaust. Uh, and uh, Joe Bradley uh, is witnessing this, because you were fairly late to the party this week at Daytona, but that's the first time I think you've caught a glimpse of that, particularly uh, well, from the number three. I've got to thank Rooftop Riff for that, because yeah. he followed the Corvette round, and we were talking about it earlier, and you were describing it. I thought you... I didn't think you meant as it constantly did a lap. There is this <laughs> constant blue burn, flame burning from both exhaust, like... Bunsen, I mean, I don't even know if schools use Bunsen burners now, and people of a I certain so. age will know what, what we're talking about. There might be a, quite a lot of our listeners who haven't got a clue what we're talking about, JP. But That's um, true. I'm going to head up to Corvette and see if somebody like Doug Feehan is sitting, and uh, I'm going to ask him. I mean, that that is... Talk about efficient burn. That is burning every last droplet of fuel to the point where you're creating a... It's not exhaust gas that's leaving, it's, it's actually burnt, burning gases that's coming out of the back of that exhaust, isn't it? It's, it's still in the burn phase by the looks of that. It seems so, yeah, and I, I don't know whether that's wasted energy because it's you know, being spewed out the back rather than being burned in the chamber, in the, in the engine itself. It's exactly the same engine that uh, was in the old Corvette, by the way, but um, the way that uh, I think there's a different crank system and also the fact that it's mid-engine means that the engine note, the sound of those Corvettes, is completely different as there is sweeping up taking place in the Lexus garage. Now, that's the 12 that... That's the 12 that Shane Van Gisbergen brought in. Joe Bradley's saying it's a different engine, isn't it, in the Chevrolet Corvette? Well, it's not turbocharged. It's I know that for a fact. It's a V8, but it's a different engine that we saw in the front engine cars. Um, Do you know that for a fact? Because I thought we'd been told it was the same engine, it was just been moved. I'm sorry, Johnny, I literally could not hear a, a, a thing you said there. I, it's really do, loud. Do you know that for a fact, that statement? Or Because I, I thought we'd been told it was the same 5.5 V8 normally aspirated engine, just been moved to the middle of the car. Well, I asked someone the question about it being, well, it's still, you know, the Chevy V8. And it's, well, yes, it's a Chevy V8, but it's a brand new, it's a completely brand new engine. And oh, yes. I've, I've just arrived, you know, not completely it's, brand new design. Yeah, and, and, and John mentioned something about a, was it a flat crank or a, a something? I, I, I can't remember the detail that he said now, but the way the crankshaft is, is, is installed, it's a completely different system. Therefore, the engine sounds got, totally different. Johnny, I've got a man who'll be able to shed some light. Dan, we're just speculating as to exactly what uh, engine is in this new mid-engine Corvette. Is it, it's a different engine, I've been told, completely different engine. Yes, it's a V8, but it's a different engine than what we saw in last year's front engine car. Uh, it's a different engine for sure, but uh, at this point, we can't talk about it. No. All right, they can't talk about anything. This is a very early development of this car. The thing that started the conversation, Dan, was the, the kind of Bunsen burner flame effect that we've got constantly coming out of that exhaust. It's not exhaust gases we're seeing, we're seeing exhaust burn. It's like a, burn, a constant burn right at the very end of the exhaust. Yeah, the tailpipes are pretty short, and uh, with the power that it's making right now at nighttime, you can see the flames coming out the back, but even during the day, it's doing the same thing. So uh, in testing, we saw that, and uh, I think it's just a phenomenon that the pipes are all straight on this car and the old car they were turned so you didn't really see the flames coming out so uh anyways it looks cool at night it looks very cool dan you've been around this corvette program for a long long time does this new does this new program excite you it does uh you know it's a lot of work by all these people from you know the guys at uh, uh powertrain to you know all the guys at pratt and miller and you know, it's just an amazing group of guys and a lot of work getting done and uh, all brand new stuff. The one car's running really good. The other car, they're getting ready to come back out. So we'll see what happens. Great, so thanks. Dan Binks there, who's crew chief here at uh, Corvette. And he has really been around uh, Corvette racing for such a long time. And uh, if that man can be excited by anything like this, then then we, we all should be. And I, I know I am. I'm, I'm uh, really, uh, in, I'm going to 
do start some research into that, GP. It's uh, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Well, it's either Dan just knows all the information and doesn't want to tell us, or the engine's that top secret. Even Dan hasn't got a clue about a lot of it. I'm sure he has. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's unusual to see. Uh, so much flame licking from both exhaust pipes and he's, as he said we've seen that in testing we're not too worried about it the fact that they've got uh, over 14 hours in uh, clearly they're not too bothered about the fuel um, uh, the fuel economy of that car because uh, it's ticking off some decent stints and is now uh, very very close to the tail of the third place Porsche so GTLM, we might have only had seven cars enter that field uh, for this year's Daytona 24, but it's very closely bunched, as we've come to expect over the last, well, 10 years or so for GTLM, perhaps more. BMW, Porsche, Porsche, Chevrolet, the biggest gap is between the two RSR 19s at 21 seconds near enough, but Chassis Mostert, not a moment to lose for him. He's only seven seconds up the road from Mathieu Jaminet in the best of the Porsche 911s. That's actually the 912 numbered car for the uh, the new to IMSA 911 RSR 19. Then that 20.8 second gap there or thereabouts to the sister car and Matty Campbell, who drives that, only just ahead of the first of the Chevy Chevrolet Corvette C8Rs. Antonio Garcia, the Spaniard, is at the wheel of that car, number three. And then a little further back, Daniel Serra. But you're only talking, what, 12 seconds back to Daniel Serra. So the Ferrari's still in the hunt here. It might be 35, 40 seconds away from the race leader. But that's absolutely nothing were we to get another caution. Three minutes to four in the morning. You're tuned to RS2, IMSA Radio, across the USA and around the world. Johnny Palmer looking after things in the commentary box, and it's Joe Bradley in the pit lane, having just spoken to Dan Binks at uh, Chevrolet Corvette, and keeping an eye on uh, all the pit stops across the four different classes. DPI starting to settle down again, although I've just noticed an Acura on pit road. That's got to be the seven, and is Alexander Rossi in and back out again still has three lmp2 cars ahead of it before it can start to even think about attacking the rest of the dpi field i mentioned earlier on after the drama for the number seven at the time being driven by elia castaneves it's well worth getting that car back out which they did within 40 minutes because there are points to be picked up and as long as it finishes even if the seven cars ahead get to the flag where they are now, then it'll still pick up at eighth place points, which I'm pretty, pretty sure Jeremy Shaw mentioned earlier on was 23, and the winner gets 35, so you are only going to lose 12 points. And not the losing margin you really want to kick off the opening race of the season with, but you might be very grateful of those 12 points, those 23 points rather, at the end of the season. What I didn't, didn't expect necessarily is... Uh, this metronomic run from the other seven DPIs. Thought at least one of them might drop away and uh, the seven car could slot into its place, but that's just not happening at the moment. And these almost bulletproof DPIs then continue to pound round, including the 55 Mazda and the number 10 race leader of Kamui Kobayashi. 77 and 55 then the two Masters waiting to pick up any pieces from the podium that is at the moment locked out by three Cadillacs, the 10, the 5 and the 31. In LMP2, Simon Trummer now at the wheel of the 52 LMP2 Orica 07, all powered by Repton's finest of Derbyshire UK with the Gibson engine that is made there, the 4.2 litre V8 Again, uh, non-turbocharged power plant that powers uh, all LMP2s these days. You have a choice of four different chassis, but it's all the same block that sits in the middle of the car. And Simon Trummer, uh, how far ahead of Ben Hanley is he? 48 seconds through the last split. But Ben Hanley, you can bet, is charging very, very hard indeed. And you can see why the team put uh, 
the young man Cunian in at this time of night where conditions are cool. And that Gibson engine will be probably at its most effective right now. Tyres doing OK too. And teams likely to be double stinting where they can with only 38 sets generally at the, uh, well, the DPI's disposal, certainly. 88 Audi from WRT heading out of the International Horseshoe. Dries van Tour now at the wheel of that car. So Belgian pilot, Belgian team, sixth position and exactly five seconds off the back of Cooper McNeil's Scuderia Corsa Ferrari. That's the white one with the 63 on the side. So McNeil is fifth, Klaus Backler fourth, Bill Oberlin in the BMW from Turner third. John Potter, as mentioned, after his latest stop, dropped back to second place. But the Lamborghini Huracans are switching position with every one of their stops. And the 48 car of Corey Lewis running round in 19th overall, but uh, most crucially, the GT Daytona leader. In GTLM, ooh, the gap's come down a bit. Chazzy Mostert to... Matches Jaminet was well, seven seconds when I last checked that. It's 5.4 now. So Mostert, Jaminet, Campbell Garcia, two Porsches, the BMW that leads the Chevy Corvette in fourth position, and the Ferrari still not out of it. Timing screen is going to give us uh, a very useful gap here. It's 41.8 seconds from the BMW back to the Ferrari. So, yeah, 42 seconds which includes the top five in GTLM and all four of the manufacturers represented there too. So a caution and it's anybody's again in GTLM. GTD, sometimes a little bit difficult to read because it really depends on which uh, when which drivers have been plugged in. Remember the, the bare minimum that you need to run is a, a couple of silvers with then the pr professional drivers added onto that. Some run with one of each. Bronze, silver, gold, and then another gold or a platinum if they wish. But uh, your AM drivers have to be at least two silvers. And uh, as I say, some teams use a bronze and a silver. But then it's down to each individual team as to which order you put those drivers in, generally leaving the quicker drivers till the end of the race. It's always a decision to be made in terms of uh, when cars are qualified, whether you put the hot shoes in or the, uh, the amateur drivers so that they then start the race. Remember, whoever qualifies the car has to start the 24 hours. Four bright white headlights on the front of the BMW number 24 then, heading into the chicane on the back stretch. If you want to get in touch with us, by the way, and join the conversation, by all means you can, at IMSA Radio. Make sure you include the hashtag IMSA Radio D24. Standing for Daytona 24, of course. Hashtag IMSA Radio D24. And plenty of people are doing that right now, so thank you for your company strike up a conversation or a discussion topic about uh, what you've seen this year at Daytona. The all-important announcement on Friday that uh, came out of this place as well about the future of the top class at not only Daytona 24 but also the 24 Hours of Le Mans and the World Endurance Championship too. Considerable amount of overlap or convergence as it's being called for the future but also the classes that have already been planned for the new season of WEC, which starts later on this year at Silverstone, which is the new hypercar era, that's still continuing too. So we're going to have the grandfathered cars from LMP1, hypercar, and potentially within that Toyota and Aston Martin with Peugeot on the fringes as well, although not for this forthcoming season. And then the brand new LMD, H category but you've also got uh, well that will incorporate DPI 2.0 so the potential for cars that we more traditionally see at the 24 hours of Le Mans 
coming here to the 24 hours of Daytona to race and to Sebring. And then exciting, I'm sure, for American fans is that uh, the DPI category, DPI 2.0, will now be eligible for the 24 hours of Le Mans. So, harking back, really, to the World Sports Car Championship days of the 1970s, someone who remembers that very well is Joe Bradley. Here's a thought for me, he says, in my ears. Go on. I, I wouldn't say... I remember it very well, Johnny. I was a child. Um, I, 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 have, just I have read up on that time of the morning. Go on. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the... Uh, and we've already spoken to Wayne Taylor about got his thoughts on it. And, you know, the, the, the kind of team that Wayne Taylor has, I'm sure, you know, the interested parties in including in the programme of racing in the United States in the Inter Championship would be to add a trip to Le Mans in there and go off and win Le Mans um, in whichever form you, you, you choose, you know, if there's a convergence of regulations and everybody's waiting eagerly to see what those regulations are going to be and I think they're going to be announced exactly in more detail at Sebring. But uh, here's the thought I wanted to, to pose to uh, not just you, but JP, but all of the listeners and get your thoughts. How about this being a round of the World Endurance Championship? Just like it was in the 70s, the World Endurance World Sports Car Championship had both the Daytona 24 hours and the Le Mans 24 hours as part of that World Championship. And uh, you know what? The concept of convergence is very much that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, certainly the possibility of, uh, of longer races across the World Endurance Championship. I mean, we've also already got uh, various different race lengths for season 2019-2020. We've had four hours, six hours, we had the eight hours of Bahrain in early December last year. We've got the 1,000 miles of Sebring to come, so there are longer races. We haven't yet, though, in the current era of the WEC that started in 2012 had two 24-hour races in the same season he says desperately thinking back but uh, the 2012 season began at Sebring with the 12 hours and that was a kind of IMSA and WEC race all combined but uh, done to uh, timed by different systems and it was all very complex I think now that uh, we've got to convergence on the horizon you know you could potentially run the Sebring 12 hours for both championships and yes the scope is there to open the WEC well it wouldn't be opening the WEC but uh, the sort of halfway through the season would be the Daytona 24 hours um, but yeah many involved in the 2012 Sebring 12 hours uh, would rather wish it, it probably wasn't run the way it was in those days uh, because it was two races in one very much and, and I think two timing systems in use as well so the graphics were a nightmare uh, but uh, now that we would have the, the two categories or, or rather this, this umbrella formula LMP1 and LMDH and also uh, TPI 2.0 all encompassing the top class uh, that would make uh, combining events much much easier Joe Bradley uh, Joe Bradley's got another point, go on. I've heard that it was like a game of football with two balls and both balls counted and you could score goals with both balls. Can you imagine that? Well, yeah, I've, I've also heard, heard it I've explained heard... where, but yeah, you, yeah, you have I've... two soccer matches, but imagine one pitch uh, uh, north-south and the other pitch east-west and you've got, therefore, four lots of goals and two balls. I mean, Heidelf's always said that would be a great way of playing football. So four <laughs> football teams all on the pitch at the same time. Let's not get into that. You need two referees and two different coloured balls. No, no, but and he says be, he wouldn't says be able to have an offside. He says you don't cover the balls differently. You have two white balls and either ball counts. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, um, I've got a pit stop just to drag us back to reality. Oh, go on. It's a 31 card to the wheel and engineering uh, that has come in. And uh, again, once again, no driver change. And tyres and fuel, so that's pretty standard. Down here for the 31, that's the wheel and engineering Cadillac. I think it's Michael Conway. Mike Conway stays at the wheel of that car. You'll be able to confirm that for me, Johnny. But uh, it was not my fault. Nice little sound bite to wake everybody up at home. Lovely. And welcome back, Simon Herring, who's uh, just woken up in his 
house in France, in northern France there, and he's a, an hour ahead of the UK, so it's, uh, he's had a bit of a lie-in this Sunday morning, ten hasn't past he? Ten. That's uh, the sort of clock hours that uh, Joe and I tend to work with, certainly on a Sunday morning, anyway. Uh, so, yes, uh, some middle to late risers in the UK and Europe, but plenty of the Daytona 24 hours still to go, nine and a half hours on the clock, and it is 11 minutes past four in this part of Florida. We're about five miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean, and driving from Orlando, well, best part of an hour's drive, it's about 50 miles northeast of Orlando, but a very easy journey to make. And the second round of the championship, of course, takes place not very far away from here at uh, the hugely historic Sebring venue, World War II air base, and the concrete blocks that form the main straight there have never changed, so they can tell some stories through the years of the Sebring 12 hours. So WEC and IMSA's WeatherTech Sports Car Championship combining for the second time for Super Sebring. That's over the weekend of the 18th, 19th, 20th and 21st of March for the 68th annual Sebring 12 hours. 9-12, Porsche heads out of the second horseshoe on the infield. Bit of traffic ahead. It's Macho Jamine still at the wheel, so putting in the hard yards this early in the morning and staying very much in touch with the GTLM leader who remains Australian driver Chas Mostert who hails from Melbourne, Australia and the 24 car now onto the back straight easy to lose that car in the darkness the BMW that is not so much the all white Porsche Porsche have made those two cars very close to being identical. Um, this time of night, it's tricky to tell them apart, but there is one with a white body color and then the windshield strip is also white, but there's a little bit of silver detailing or gray detailing here and there. And then the number 12, 912 car is more gray, predominantly gray with white bits uh, just underneath the driver's window body length. So from the bottom of the A pillar all the way to the back of the car and the base of the rear wing, but yeah, with this little amount of light around, it is very tricky to tell the 911 and the 912 apart, and I'm indebted to the Andy Blackmore uh, spotter's guide for those uh, minor differences between the two. Yeah, it is a fair bit more grey. And that white strip then from front to back on the sides of the 912, just ahead Cooper McNeil in the 63 Ferrari now. That's a GT Daytona car. Let's see whether it still is Cooper at the wheel. Yes. And there's been a change for the on-running number 25 BMW. No longer in the hunt for GTLM after two early problems for that car, one of which took it behind the wall. Bruno Spengler then having to just go about his business and pick up any points that he can. The one saving grace is that the number four car has had a lot of dramas as well and uh, is still in the pit lane, been there for a long time. The number four Chevrolet Corvette of Marcel Fessler. So it does mean that Bruno Spengler now runs sixth in GTLM. The other five cars, though, still in with the chance of a podium in GTLM with the BMW, the other BMW 24 and the two Porsches uh, in those podium positions as I speak. Nine hours, 26 minutes to go. And out of speedway, turn one, goes the 24 BMW then across the strike now. And 1.6 seconds further back is the Macha Jamine Porsche. GTD still got the two Lamborghini Huracans from different teams leading the way. Paul Miller and G GRT Magnus with half a minute between those two cars. Ooh, very tight now between Klaus Backler and Dries Vantor, I notice, with about a second separating the third and fourth place GTD cars. So Backler, having just done a 146.7, uh, yeah, is slower than Dries Vantor. A little bit of that might be traffic-induced. 
but that's something to look out for the bottom step of the podium potentially set to change but of course the traffic that back backless just had to negotiate Dries van Tor's going to have to slice his way through as well car into the pits joe which one have you got yeah we've got i think fourth place <laughs> with Ferrari exhaust gas there. Uh, it's the 63 Scuderia Corsa WeatherTech car. Cooper McNeil brought the car in and he's uh, he's hopped out tyres and fuel as per the course of the events. We'll get a word with Cooper. Uh, his weekend's been pretty good to him, hasn't it? He mm. for, won a race in the Ferrari Challenge earlier on this weekend and uh, currently in contention, I think... They were either third or fourth, Johnny. You've got a timing screen in front of you. Yeah, you have. Tell me. And yeah, fourth from memory. Going to feed back in. Well, actually showing sixth now, but I think that's because a couple of cars have jumped ahead. Certainly wasn't fourth because Dries Vantor's there. So I think they, the Ferrari's chopping and changing with Dennis Olsen's Faf Motorsport Porsche. It's in the fight for a top five, certainly. And if there are any drivers up ahead, it could potentially luck into a podium as well. But these two Lamborghini Huracans look to be dominant right now. And now that scrap between Backler and Vantor, third and fourth, down to just half a second. So Dries Vantor really turning it on at this early hour in the morning. Cooper McNeil, though, can now have a quick chat with Joe Bradley. Did you, did you enjoy that, Cooper? How <laughs> uh, well? I was driving a Ferrari at night at Daytona, so... <laughs> yeah, that's exactly Absol what my Absol point was. Absolutely. Yeah, that was exactly my point. You got exactly what I meant. Um, this weekend's been good to you so far at Daytona. You had a, a win in the Ferrari Challenge the other day. Yeah, good start to the season. I uh, won the championship last two years in a row in the Challenge Series. I love the atmosphere in that championship. I love what Ferrari does for, uh, for the drivers, hospitality-wise. Everything's uh, tip-top. So happy to be back doing the championship uh, again this year. Uh, started out really strong, won both races, two pole positions and two fast laps. So perfect weekend so far for me. We just got one, one, little, one little race to go and, uh, and uh, hopefully we, it tops it off. Well, so far so good, Cooper. I've got to say you guys are in contention. It's a very competitive class GTD though, isn't it? Yeah, it's the most competitive class in the field, uh, probably top three in the world. So, uh, yeah, I'd say pretty darn competitive. Um, our, our WeatherTech uh, Scuderia Corsa Ferrari has been pretty strong all weekend. We uh, qualified P2 for the 24 hours, which was a great lap by Jeff Westfall uh, in the car. And we've been, uh, yeah, running top top five uh, consistently throughout the entire day, including leading a few, few stints with uh, Tony in the car. So, obviously long way to go over nine hours to go so basically a petit Le Mans left um, time wise and uh, obviously a lot can happen uh, we need to stay clean no mechanical issues no penalties no contact no wheels off and uh, see where we end up just want to ask you the last question um, you, you've been here many times in this race uh, did the track react exactly as you expected it to do uh, when the temperature dropped uh, no, not at all, uh, and that's kind of one of the mysterious things about Daytona is uh, one one minute, one session you have a great car, and the next session uh, you scratching your head trying to figure out what happened. Um, the car this morning, uh, uh, this afternoon for early on in the race was uh, was a bit loose, so it was hard to keep uh, the rear end behind us, um, except uh, except when, when the night uh, when the night fell and all of a sudden the car came alive and we weren't sliding around so much anymore picked up some pace and we were able to fight for the lead top three uh, and then Tony taking it to, to the lead so um, yeah uh, again you know you never know what Daytona will throw at you especially with the temperature track conditions there was sand all over turn five when I was just driving now so you really have to play play it corner by corner and be safe and obviously keep in mind how much time is left and get to the finish great so thanks for talking to us Cooper Cooper McNeil there, just out of the car, and uh, very insightful. Certainly so, yeah, Cooper McNeil uh, always able to uh, portray uh, what it's like out there for these incredible race drivers and what they've got to contend with with every single stint. It's changed so much since we got underway at 1.40 yesterday afternoon. We're well over half distance now inside the final 10 hours, in fact, with uh, 14 hours and 40 minutes now completed. 
One or two thoughts coming through on Twitter then. Address these to at IMSA Radio. If you can include the hashtag IMSA Radio D24, that'll be easier for me to pluck them out. Um, Spooner in Orange says, in theory, Le Mans 2021 has the potential to be the best sounding Le Mans since, since the 80s. To go back to thoughts about the World Sports Car Championship of the 70s then and into the next decade just about. Uh, he says, V12 Aston, Corvette, Cadillac, Porsche 911 and more. He's going to have to need to order some new ear defenders. Well, you see, the dates are all a little, little bit up in the air. Obviously, we're going into hypercar this year, 2020. So that'll be the first hypercar season, 20 into 2021. It's my understanding that then the next season will be the season of convergence because DPI 2.0 has effectively been put back to 2022 here in the States. So that means that uh, September 2021 will be the start of the convergence where everybody is eligible for, for every championship, essentially. So I think Hypercar will still run as it is with the grandfathered LMP1s from this summer in the WEC. We'll have a season of that and then the DPI 2.0 cars will also be eligible to take part in the World Endurance Championship if they wish. So we'll have it in stages, LMP1 going into the new season. That's the season of a hypercar as well. And then in 12 months after that, uh, it's come one, come all, essentially. Dave Alcott making the point again, as I did earlier on, as ever, Ray Wenzel Jr. doing a great job overnight, going us, uh, giving us some superb coverage overnight. The man is a legend. Yep, echo that, particularly as he's been here for 25 years in a row now. And... One other point that I wanted to mention, uh, Tim Fulbrook says, are BMW going to be thinking, hang on a sec, we might have left the party too soon here, as the 24 M8 GTE has been seriously competitive all race, with the plans for Team RLL then to, to step away at the end of this season. Please don't go, Beamer, he says. Well, the R8 still looks strong, despite it not being part of the World Endurance Championship any longer. We had that car for a season in the WEC. Talk has been ongoing, well, since Le Mans last year, really, as to whether we might get the RLL cars to Le Mans. With Rahel uh, Landing and Letterman Racing still running their uh, BMW program in the United States. It was a different team, Team MTech, who took the M8s to Le Mans last year but there is scope still, if, as long as they can get the invitation. And invitations to Le Mans still yet to be confirmed, of course. That will be done next month. Actually, probably within the next few weeks. Out of turn one, the GTLM battle rages on. And for the lead, half a second between the two cars. And they're just heading into the International Horseshoe now. Black BMW with the number one positional light on the side from the 912, more grey than white Porsche, with the number two illuminated, and there's your battle. But in third position, uh, a bit further back now because he's just had done a pit stop, is Matty Campbell in the 911 numbered Porsche. So, about a minute back, I reckon. And then the first of the Chevrolet Corvettes, the only uh, C8R that remains in the race. Oh, as the 24 goes a touch wide. That was around the outside of the WRT Audi car 88 now being driven, or still being driven by Dries Van Tor. So he's back in it. Don't think he got ahead of Klaus Backler before the pit stops. Backler, actually he may have done because Backler's still on pit road, the 16 car. Remember Backler and uh, Dries Van Tor were scrapping away for third and fourth in GT Daytona. And WRT have got the Audi back into the race, whereas uh, the 16 Wright Motorsports Porsche still sits there on pit lane. Now, Matt Campbell back into the race is about to be lapped here by the sister car round speedway turn four. So the two Porsches, 912 and 911, uh, are now split by a lap, but GTLM leaders totally together. BMW across the line at the end of that lap, and the Porsche follows suit just a second further back as we head to the pit lane for this update from Joe Bradley. 
just gone by me, Johnny, is the GTD leader, the number 48 uh, Lamborghini. Um, it's at pit out, and I'm uh, kind of in the middle, so you've probably got a better view of it than, than me, but that's going to um, ebb and flow as we now go through the next phase of GTD pit stops with a, a potential lead changes there as we get into that. Yeah, just watching uh, that car and another, in fact, heading back into the race. So 85 Cadillac uh, and the race leading GT Daytona Lamborghini Huracan. Corey Lewis, 48, returning to the racetrack as well. That will put John Potter to the lead of GT Daytona and the 44 car. Dennis Olsen on a different strategy from the 16 and the 88 and Patrick Long's been put into the right motorsports Porsche so get you an order in just a second there Paul Miller Racing's Lamborghini now being driven by Andrea Caldarelli and Dennis Olsen to the lead of GT Daytona in fact for FAF Motorsports FAF were long-time leaders early on they had then uh, uh, various problems for that number nine car and it's uh, essentially left the essentially left the two uh, Lamborghini Huracans out front, 44 and 48. But for the time being, Norwegian Dennis Olsen uh, still able to, well, still very much wanting to drive Porsches for as long as he can, but uh, sort of more often now driving for customer teams. He was on the Porsche Junior programme a little while ago. Ah, Joe, you've got the two leaders now from GTLM on pit road together. Not sure whether you're anywhere close to the BMW and the Porsches. Uh, they're in slightly different places, aren't they? Because the BMW is the next pit box after the road that takes you behind the wall. So 24, Chas Moster, Mathieu Jaminet pitting much closer to pit in in the 912. And, I, and I'm right in the middle, Johnny. I've got the BMW to my left to pit out as I look towards you and the Porsche to my right. I, I think I saw a driver change with the 24 car, the BMW, and obviously fuel and tyres, so we, we've got, we're about to see a driver change there. I'm afraid when I look, and it looks like a... No, it wasn't. The Porsche moved off the apron quicker than the BMW, of course, because it was the last one, or the first one, I should say. Um, no change for the lead, the BMW, uh, leads the Porsche out, that's the number 24 BMW and the number 912 Porsche there, so no change for the GTLM lead. Yeah, Porsche got away, but of course it got to its pit box earlier because yes, it's uh, yeah, um, much closer to pit in. Uh, loads of wheel spin though from the black BMW and as, it's, as it was scrabbling for grip, I thought it was going to be a bit closer between the 912 and the 24. They will rejoin and almost instantaneously I should be able to give you a gap between uh, Jesse Crone now, who's been put in the 24 car, so Mostert out, Crone in, Mathieu Jaminet though staying on board, and as soon as they head through the first split, I'll tell you what the gap is, don't really need a timing screen to be honest, just look out the window, but it's 1.3 seconds, and uh, Jaminet, well he might be able to get the tyres up to temperature more readily than the BMW, and that's going to be crucial, they're both on cold tyres remember, but Jaminet, ah maybe they didn't put new tyres on that car, so Jam Jam still with warm Michelins it would appear, whereas the new driver Jesse Crone has been given cold Michelin tyres, so if that is the case, the 912 needs to take the lead as early as possible. They're side by side, and Mathieu Jaminet does take the lead of GTLM into Speedway Turn 1. The Frenchman, I think, still on the same tyres. That might have bought it a bit of time. We wouldn't have bought any time in the pits because we know the fuel is the longest thing that has to take place in the pit lane. 9.12, then down the back straight, just ahead of the 24 and desperately trying to get those tyres up to operating temperature is Jesse Crone. He's almost going to be overtaken here by a GTD Mercedes, the uh, 74 car, which is the Riley Motorsports machine of Lawson Ashenbach. So having to fend that to, fend, uh, that to Mercedes back, I think he's just about calmed the storm there. And the ch two GTLM cars are about to be stormed by. Uh, with the Mazda, 55 Mazda, driven by Jonathan Bomarito, right round the outside. But that was crucial for track position in GTLM. Clearly, Porsche and the GT team, American-based outfit that run those Porsches then, 
on the German manufacturer's behalf. Uh, had to, well, maybe do a little bit of on-the-spot strategy there to think, how can we get ahead of this BMW? And they double stinted the tyres, whereas BMW seemed not to because that car had zero grip coming out of the pits and onto the infield. It's back in the window, though, now, and Jesse Crow doesn't want to lose that Porsche from sight. I think we're going to be treated to nose-to-tail action from both of those cars, at least for the next couple of stints. And beyond that, every possibility. 14 hours and 50 minutes to go. Up onto the high banks, the 31 degree of Camber goes the GTLM battle. And in third position, Matt Campbell is on a storm as well. He's only 20 seconds back, which was about the margin prior to those stops. And uh, Campbell has just set the personal best time, not only for him, but also for his car, 911, through the first sector. So this could be a pretty special lap as well, as long as it's uh, clear ahead of him. So, yes, he went and lapped down briefly, but that was as we were going through the pit stop cycle. And it's now unfolded to leave us with a 20-second gap from second to third in GTLM. It's happening at the head of the order. Renga van der Zander uh, is in the number 10 car now, taking over from Kanwe Kobayashi in the last stop. And the number 10 car leading by 34 seconds. Nine seconds separate the Mike Conway 31, that's the uh, Whalen Engineering Racing car, from the Mustang Sampling Racing sponsored caddy. So 9.4 seconds the gap there. Two Masters come next, fourth and fifth, 77 from 55. Then it's Dane Cameron in the Acura car number six and Matthias Leist in the 85 JDC Miller Motorsports Cadillac is in seventh position. GTLM heading into the Western Horseshoe with a, an LMP2 car wanting to get by, but uh, the drivers of the LMP uh, of the GTLMs, Matthias Jamine and Jesse Crone, far focused on, far too focused on the road in front. I think now Crone has spotted the LMP2 car. He has. That's a 52, isn't it? Simon Trummer sneaking through on the inside out of turn six, and we'll be able to clear the two GTLM leaders well before the braking area for the chicane on the back straight. Dennis Olsen in GT Daytona. Ah, he's in the pits now, as is John Potter. So Andrea Caldarelli, who is pitting still with about the same number of laps per stint, but about 20 minutes before these two cars. So the GT Daytona cars have gone on to rather different uh, pit stop rhythms. Off kilter? Well, not necessarily. Uh, it is rather a bit too early to be back timing uh, your stints all the way to the end of the race. A GT Daytona car can generally do about 55 to 60 minutes comfortably. If it's in fuel safe, maybe stretching it out to 65 minutes as out of turn one goes the goes the GTLM battle. So Porsche from BMW out of turn one and into the first of the horseshoes. This is an epic scrap in GTLM, and I don't think they're really slowing each other up, but Matt Campbell on a storm in third as well, now down to 18 and a half seconds. Be great to have three GTLM cars fighting it out for the lead of their class. Welcoming back John Hindoff now to the RS2 IMSA radio booth. Morning. Good morning, John. Just a wood sort of signpost further forward, and we are a little ways away. Don't forget that the Michelin Endurance Cup, which runs through the longer races of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, does award interim points at 6, 12 and 18. Now, obviously, we've gone through two of those markers, but there are a few teams out there, not all of them, but there are a few teams out there who will prioritise those time junctions and try and grab a few extra points, even if that, that means changing their pit lane strategy. Um, change around, not only in the booth here, but also in the pit lane too. So Joe Bradley stepping away for a break. Diana Binks, therefore, coming back to pit road. And the first guy that she, she's been able to chat to is Townsend Bell from the number 12 uh, Aimvassa Sullivan Lexus team. Just watch the number 14 go out there. What was going on? 
Uh, they had to do a brake change. Unfortunately, they had a little issue on the right front on the 14, so it took a lot longer than, uh, than it probably should have, but uh, they kept fighting through it. On the 12 car, Shane had an issue getting off on cold tires on the outlap there. We had some damage to the front end, so we're back at the garage getting that repaired as well. So it's been a, you know, you've got a few challenges going on, but I think a lot of people have seemed to have been caught out with not getting the tires up to temperature, but the conditions here, they've been slightly different to what was expected. Yeah, and these temperatures, you've got to get through the first three corners. It's so treacherous. If you can get through turn six, all right, uh, they'll start to come in, but but it's really difficult. It just caught us out. We'll, we'll keep fighting here. It's a shame because actually for both cars, things were looking pretty good there. Then all of a sudden in the, the snap of a finger, uh, we're, we're, we're in a hole here. So uh, long way to go, but uh, we're going to have to dig pretty hard here. What's the strategy going to be for you? Right now, it's just minimum drive time. You know, uh, I'm short by minimum drive time, so I need to get in here. Shane's going to finish out his, and then we got to check on Frankie and Aaron. What does it take to get a good clean lap around here, especially at this time of the morning? Say one more time. What, what it does take? it take to get a good clean lap around this circuit, especially at this time in the morning? Well, with 38 cars and probably fewer now, it's it's not as bad as it used to be. But uh, at night, it's just you know spotting your points and and uh, trusting in the grip that you've got available, which is generally a little bit higher at night once the tires are warm. Thanks, Dan. Tanzer Bell with Diana Binks. That car that he shares with Shane Van Gisbergen is in 14th position. Great run from the WRT Audi number 88 down the back straight. Dries Vantor fighting with Spencer Pompelli. Can he get it stopped into the chicane? And he makes a place as well. Brilliant driving from the younger of the two Vantor brothers. We've got the other one in action in the race, of course, in GTLM. Laurence driving his Porsche. But Dries Vantor is a little superstar and uh, for a very different manufacturer. But car 88 for his fellow Belgian squad making that move stick. And it was all about the drive off turn six, essentially, through speedway turns one and two, and a bit of side draft as well on Spencer Papelli's 44 car. Yeah, side draft, not necessarily speeding up your car, but what it does do is slow down the car that you're trying to pass. Pat Long went past Spencer Pompelli on that lap as well, Johnny. Uh, so Pat Long now with the 16 right motorsport car the light blue and gloss black machine now in second position 51 seconds away from the lead andrea calderali is in the 48 paul miller racing lamborghini so the top three now significant changes for gtd on that lap still the 48 lamborghini from pmr leading then the 16 right porsche then the 88 audi in third position spencer pompelli down to fourth in the 44, the Magnus Racing at Lamborghini. Jeff Westfall, another five, call it six seconds further back for the 63 WeatherTech Scuderia Corsa car. And then he's got seven and a half seconds on the first of the BMWs, of the BMW, the 96 car of Dylan McAvern for Turner Motorsport. So Matthew Jamine, after st staying with the tyres that he had in the earlier stint, was uh, very, very good indeed on the outlap to get ahead of Jesse Crone. Uh, but the two cars have stayed with each other pretty much since then. Just going to get underneath the 86 uh, Acura, the NSX, and rapid flashing of the lights there from Jesse Crone to make sure that the driver of 86 has seen him too. Driver of 86 being Jules Gounon for Maya Shack Racing with Kerb Agajanian. So out of turn six they will go. Just slowed the BMW down a little bit, getting by that Acura. And up onto the high banks now, some work to do for Jesse Crone as Matcha Jaminet disappears into the night. Or the early morning, shall we say, because it's uh, very nearly 20 to 5. That means we're approaching the end of another race hour. Uh, you're tuned to RS2 IMSA Radio. It's 107.9 FM here at the track around the world on Sirius 216 and XM202 around the States as well. Live from tracks at Daytona International Speedway. And the next hour of racing starts now. Good morning 
to everybody who is uh, tuned in, whether you're uh, maybe in the UK where it's 20 to 10, an hour later on the uh, western side of uh, the European continent, or indeed further afield, enjoying 